Shalom, shalom, and welcome to Kingdom Treasures, the teaching ministry of Messianic teacher Rav Angus Marichaud, the founder of Shekinah Restoration Messianic Fellowship. Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the world, says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid, then in his joy goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Matthew 13, 44 We believe that Yeshua proclaimed, prioritized, and personified the powerful and in-breaking reign of the kingdom of the God of Israel, first to the lost sheep of the family of Israel, then to all nations. The Hebraic perspective is a golden key that unlocks the treasures of Holy Scripture. May you be enriched and equipped through kingdom treasures. And now, with today's teaching, here is Rav Angus Marichaud. Shalom, shalom everyone. Grace and shalom from our Elohim and Father of our Master, Yeshua HaMashiach. And to Him be praise and glory and dominion before all time, now and forever and ever. We bless him and we declare he is blessed forever and ever. It is with great joy that we come to you again, kingdom treasures, sharing the mysteries of the kingdom, upholding our master, our Jewish Messiah, upholding his Torah and declaring boldly that he is the son of Elohim, the son of David. So as we get into this message, we pray by God's grace that he would indeed arise, that his enemies be scattered, and that he would bring forth revelation and set the children of God free from every uh, device, every wile, every deception of the enemy, so that we could walk in truth before him. We have no greater joy than to see our children walk in truth. And we pray in God that the word that is going to be spoken now would continue to impact many both near and far. And whenever this message is heard, again, the scripture would be fulfilled that the God of Shalom is put in Hasatan, may his name be obliterated under our feet to the praise of his glory as we become like King Messiah. So today we want to speak on the theme, making his enemies his footstool. Making his enemies his footstool. And if you could kindly open the scriptures with me, open your mind, open the scriptures, and allow the spirit of holiness to guide us into all truth. So we are going to the Psalm, Psalm 110. This is our, our, our proof text, as it were, that we want to bring forth to all of us that we will get an understanding of this uh, message, making his enemies his footstool. And we're beginning in Psalm 110. Psalm 110, it reads, verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has swore and will not change his mind. You are priests forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shut the kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpse. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. So this is what is presented to us. A psalm by David. Psalm 110. And out of that uh, psalm, you would see the verse that says, until I make your enemies a footstool. So the message is making his enemies his footstool. Making his enemies his footstool. And I want us to see where that uh, 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 title, where that text is coming from. All right. So what about Psalm 110? Well, it is the most quoted chapter, the most quoted psalm in the apostolic scriptures. When I use the phrase apostolic scriptures, I'm referring to Matthew to Revelation. The scriptures written by the Shaliak, the apostles, the emissaries, the sent ones of Rabbi Yeshua, right? Remember, Rabbi Yeshua is the chief rabbi, and he's sending out his apostles. And apostles is a functionary title that says that you're being sent to, 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 to advance the mission of your master. You are an emissary, you are an ambassador. And Rav Shaul defined himself as an ambassador in change, an apostle to the Gentiles, sent forth 
all right? Called an apostle with a mission separated from my mother's womb to, to, to reveal the, the mystery of Messiah to the nations. So that's what it is. So Psalm 110, please note, this psalm, of all other psalms, this is the psalm that is most quoted by the apostles. This, this, this was a frame of reference that they had. So if it was important to them, it ought to be import, important to us. And out of the 15 times it is quoted, nine of them are quoted in the book of Hebrews. Or 15 times it's quoted in the whole apostolic scriptures. But nine of them is quoted in the book of Hebrews. Either quoted explicitly or there is an allusion, an implicit quote. For quote. So go with me. Let's get, let's get a, a flavor of that quote. Go with me to the uh, book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews. And we're going to pick up from verse chapter 1, verse 13. We just want to look. We can't go through all of them, but I just want to give you a feel of where it is. All right? So Hebrews 1, verse 13 tells us this. But to which of the angels has he said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The question is being asked, so which of the angels? Did he say that to Gabriel? Did he say that to Micah? Did he say that to Raphael, Uriel? Did, did, did he say that to any of these archangels that we know? We know about Michael and Gabriel, but the, uh, 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 the, the scriptures tell us also that Daniel got a revelation of other archangels. All right? And we have their names given to us. But to which of them? Did he ever say, sit at my right hand? He's telling us something, that whoever is at his right hand is not created. It's not a created being. That, 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 you have to let that sink in. The implications of that is astounding when you come to understand what he's saying to us, right? So to which of the angels he ever said? So immediately you, 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 you're refuting the lie that Yeshua is just divine and not deity. You're refuting the lie. And this is held by, by thousands of people. But we expose the lie that Yeshua is just a, a, a created being. He's just a, an archangel. He, he, he's created. He, he, he had existence. He came into being. No, Messiah didn't come into being. He came, to, he came as it were, to us to, in, into revelation. He didn't come into existence. He was revealed to us. He was already there. All right, so which of the angels did he say that? Immediately, you should see where I'm going with this, right? Verse 13. Right, go with me also to chapter 5. Still in the book of Hebrews, verse 6. Chapter 5, verse 6 in Hebrews. Just as he says also in another passage. But what another passage? Look, look at right there. You are priests forever according to the order of men. Can you see that? Where is he quoting from? Psalm 110. Psalm 110. And then go across with me to chapter 10. Verse 13, chapter 10, verse 13. Look at that again. Okay, you, you've got to see it, right? Are you seeing it now, Be beloved? Chapter 10, verse 13. Waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. So if you know Psalm 110, you would see that the writer of the book of Hebrews is telling us what the argument that he's presenting to the Hebrews back then and to us today is to know this one who is at the Father's right hand. And you and I must, must know that. Who is he who is at the Father's right hand? So we see it because this is a big piece of understanding that we need to have to understand the book of Hebrews and to understand who Mashiach is, who is this person, right? But there's another psalm that the apostles would make reference to. I would just make reference to it quickly. It's Psalm 118. Psalm 118, where they would have said that the stone that the builders rejected has become the, the, the chief cornerstone. It is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. They quoted that too, all right? So they, but, but Psalm 110 was, was the one that was quoted more. So if you could make a cash, if you could put together Psalm 110 and Psalm 118, you see, oh, the son of the right hand is there with a view to making his enemies his footstool. Because right now, this stone will be rejected, but he's going to subdue his enemies, and it will be marvelous in our eyes when all the enemies come to understand what we have come to understand, that he is the son of David, the son of God. And that's just bringing together Psalm 110 and Psalm 118. These are the scriptures that the apostles would have proclaimed. These are the scriptures that we have inherited. And we have to be faithful to the witness as we study the text and continue to embrace that which they are telling us to embrace. All right. So going on from that, we begin to see the rejected one. All right, and he's rejected today by so many. All right, uh, we, we, we proclaim him. You are he, the Messiah, the son of the living God. You are the Messiah God. And we're going somewhere with this because 
This is challenging. This is an um, absurdity. This, you have Judaism for the most part, rejecting Yeshua as the Messiah. Judaism is looking for the Messiah to come. So there they are messianic, but they reject Yeshua as the Messiah. And where's that coming from? Because an enemy has done this. All right, the texts that are presented are not received. There's wrestling, there's arguing. But who is behind that? The father of lies. And there's some who accept his deity. They know that he is the son of God. God, very God. But they minimize and downplay his Jewishness, that he is of the tribe of Judah, that he is the son of David, and that makes him a Jew that makes him Jewish. In our term, to our language today is Jewish. And don't be afraid of using the word Jew and Jewish. If you are afraid, and, or if you, you, you minimize it, again, you're buying into the lie of the enemy. Because this one that we proclaim to you, this unknown God that we proclaim to you is Emmanuel. Not an angel. To which of the angels of the age says sit at my right hand? He is God. Very God. He is the son of David. And so you have to embrace him as a God-man. And some embrace him as God-man, but they don't understand that the man part is a Jewish man. You see, all of that has to be taken into account. He's Eckhart. So you can't leave out any aspect. You can't overplay and underplay anything about him. You've got to receive him and reveal and, and have who he is as he is coming to us. Because the enemy will come to steal, kill, and destroy Steal a little part of the understanding. Destroy your frame of reference. Murder you so that you, you, you're, you're bereft of knowing who this Messiah is. But I proclaim to you, he is the son of God at the father's right hand. He is the son of David. We're going to get into that, all right? So go with me to Mark chapter 12. We're going to look at this. Mark chapter 12, our master, in, 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 just before his crucifixion, he's... He is having a discussion with his brethren. And I'm saying his brethren because the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians, they, 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 they were uh, 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 his brethren. You don't think that he was fighting against them. He was trying to bring them to Teshuva, right? So he's having this discussion with them. If you pick it up from uh, Mark 12, verse 34. He is asking them a question. You see, they had asked him all these questions, right? They asked him. They, they said, okay. So the Sadducees came and said, okay, we, don't, we, we know we don't believe in the resurrection. So we're going to pose this question to you. Uh, uh, and this question, you really, you, you think it, that, that, that you're believing in the resurrection. Well, we have this question. This, this, this is a stump of, so they thought, that, that, okay, this woman had seven husbands. And you could re read the text. So in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? That's a stumper. So they thought that they really had Yeshua backed up in a corner. They said, oh, yeah, no, I never thought about that. You're right. But the Messiah said, you do greatly err. <laughs> Understanding the scriptures, not the power of God. And he used a present text. One text from their understanding of the Torah. Because the Sadducees only embraced the Torah in its literal understanding. So he used that very thing. Answer fool according to his folly. He, he used that very wisdom to, to, to show them how their reasoning was, was errant. They didn't know the scriptures. No, they didn't understand the power of God. Because when you're re resurrected, you are like angels. There's no marriage. Now, this can be unsettling for some people who may have lost their, their loved one. They say, I'm going to be, when I die, I'm going to be with them. Well, not really. You're going to be where that person is, but that person will no longer be your husband or wife. All right? You're going to understand that. You have to think they are like angels. That that relationship of marital relationship is no longer there. But something that is better, that is greater, is there. So if your limited understanding is that, okay, I'm going to be with my wife, going to be my husband, well, I'm pulling the theological rug from under you and waking you up to realize you're not going to see and be in, on clouds and, and with, your, with your spouse living forever in a mansion. That's a lie from the pit of hell. We need to understand what it's going to be so that we can prepare ourselves for truth rather than take refuge in lies. So he debunked their lies. And of course, the Herodians brought this question to him, should we pay taxes? And, and he said, okay, whose image? And they said, this is the image of God. All right, you're in the image of God. So give to God everything. Give to Caesar what belongs to him. But you are in the image of God and God wants all of you. All right, not just a single coin that has Caesar. And then of course, another Pharisee asked him this question. All right, genuinely want you to know there are 613 commandments, Father, our uh, uh, Master. Which one is the greatest? You are rabbi. Tell us. And then, of course, he gave this answer. He said, We are after you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And then you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
All right, and he said, on these hang all the 613, not, not diminishing them, but in order of priority. Out of love, you would find yourself doing all the other commandments. And of course, there's another commandment that he spoke about. You shall love the stranger as yourself. So really, you say, okay, to master, the greatest is you shall love God. And another one is like on it. You shall love your neighbor. And yet another one is like on it. You shall love your stranger. But he noticed he didn't quote that last part. Why? Because he wanted us to understand that our neighbor is our stranger. Our stranger is our neighbor. That's the whole thing on the parable on the Good Samaritan. To show us that. That our enemy, our stranger is our neighbor. Who's our neighbor? The one that we demonstrate and manifest the glory of God to. Right? Borkashem. So he's given us this. And then now he gives them a question. They're trying to stump him. So he asks them a question. And we pick it up in, in, in verse 34. After that, no one ventured to ask him any more questions. Because, of course, he, 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 they, they couldn't stump him. He stumped them. And they, So verse 35. Yeshua began to say as he taught in the temple. How is it that the scribes say? That the Messiah is the son of David. How is that possible? David himself said in the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies, be beneath, uh, your enemies beneath your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So in what sense is he his son? In what sense? Because David is speaking in a sense. You need to know what sense is he his Lord? He is his son. But in what sense is he his Lord? Something is happening here. He's, he's looking at an absurdity and he's acting. Because you see, this question caught their attention. Because everybody knew. Right? The Jewish people were quite literate. They knew the scriptures. Everybody knew that the Messiah is the son of David. The Pharisees knew that. The Sadducees knew that. The Herodians knew that. The common people knew that. So what do you mean asking me is he the son of David? It's like asking is a rabbi Jewish? Is the Pope Catholic? It's like asking that. What do you mean? That's an absurdity. All right? But I, I, I caution us. In the absurdities of life is where God reveals himself to us. What we may think is an absurdity. That's absurd. Really? In there, God is wanting to reveal something. Else. And our absurdity becomes a wall that prevents us from seeing that what we consider an absurdity is normative to God. May God bless us as he helps us to, to not build walls of resistance. And be careful where, where, you, where, where you dig in and say, that's it. Anything else is absurd. Really? With God, nothing is impossible. All right? That when Ezekiel was asked, uh, you son of man, can these bones live? He deferred right back to God. Lord, you know. That's a good answer. <laughs> Lord, you know. Because I know there's something else that you're telling me that I'm not seeing. So tell me what I'm not seeing. Tell me what is hidden in plain view, right? So he asked them this question, and of course, and they answered him. Uh, uh, and he, uh, he answered them, and of course, they wanted to ask that question because, okay, if, if, if somehow they answer that question, they, he will tell them, remember in one place he said, listen, if it was from, if John's baptism uh, 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 um, is from heaven, then why didn't you go? All right? And if you say it's not so, then... Um, they know that David is, is, is speaking about the Messiah. So they, 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 they're in a, a, a catch-22 situation. He tried, he, they were trying to put him in a catch-22, you know, either or, you know, but he put them back in one. It's amazing how he does that. And he used the very text to bring them that. But of course, he was trying to show them something that is much more. But I want us to go back with me to um, uh, Psalm 110. Psalm 110, this Psalm, as I said, that we all should know. All right, we all should know because you're going to see how God is going to open this psalm up for us. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. I was studying this thing through and I found out that there are some Jewish objections as to why it is that they are not accepting this psalm. Because in the days of the Messiah, this was a stumper for the Jewish people then. But there are Jewish people today who Christians present this psalm to and they also have their objections. All right, so they don't want to accept that this psalm is showing something that was a, a reversal in protocol. How is it that David is saying, you are my master? How is that possible? I thought you were the son of David. We know that he's the son of David. But how it is David, who's his son, is calling him Lord? That's a divine reversal. That's, that's, that's absurd, right? That a son would call his 
that, that, that David, a father, would call his, his, his descendant master. That's unusual. And that's the master rabbi bringing out something that's hidden in plain view. But today, the Jewish people, when, when we present that some of them, they bring this argument. They, they, I, I remember reading a portion of book 26, reasons why Jewish people don't believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. They have 26 reasons to prove that he's not the Messiah. I say to believers, do you have reasons to believe that he is? Do you have your counter arguments? Can you defend the reputation and integrity of the master just as the Jewish people feel that they have their defense? Do you have reasons to put forward on a scholarly level, on an experiential level, that this Yeshua that you believe in, you know and have come to believe who you are believing in? Or is it just, well, I believe, and that's it. No, 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 no. You, that may be so on some levels, but to interact with other people, you got to know. And you got to know that you know, and you got to be able to counteract their arguments. And it's okay because we are wrestling with the text. By the end of the day, the Messiah will come and reveal to us who he is. But you have to be able to prove from scripture. You have to stand on scripture. Don't just tell me, well, this is it. No, tell me from the scripture. Let's reason from the text. And then we could uh, advance our arguments, right? And we have arguments, come to argument. We're not argument in the sense of fighting it down. No. Because once you start to get angry, the, the anger of man doesn't work the righteousness of God. But we should be able to agitate. We should be able to wrestle. Sparks flying. Because what do we want? Truth. Not to win an argument. We want truth. And so we and I need to at least consider the objections our brethren put forward. <clears throat> so they say, okay. Psalm 110, the Lord says to my Lord. If you look carefully at that text in your Bible, you will see that my Lord there is capital L. Capital L. Now, this is a small thing, but I want you to see it's a big thing in the Jewish mind. They say in Hebrew, there's no capitalization. So by putting that second Lord in capital, you are like, I learned an expression, it's called shoehorn. Shoehorn means that you're trying to force into an, an inadequate space something that doesn't fit. All right. So you're trying, they say the Christian translations are trying to shoehorn Jesus into the Jewish biblical text because there's no capitalization in, in Hebrew. You understand that? So keep in mind, there's no capitalization in, in, in Hebrew. There's no capitalization in Greek. You have to remember that the capitalization comes because the translators are trying to give honor, trying to give respect. So they capitalize a word. All right. But don't think, OK, look, it's capitalized. And that means that not necessarily. You got to know your words. You got to know your text. Right, don't go away thinking, okay, wait, you read in the apostle scriptures, capital S, and that means the Holy Spirit, but common S that means the human spirit. Listen, in the Greek, there's no capitalization. You got to look at the context to see what God is saying to us. And sometimes he may be referring to the Ruach HaKodesh, and sometimes he may be referring to the human spirit. And you got to be able to, in context to see whether or not the translators interpreted it right. But don't go away thinking, look in the text, the King James Bible, capital S, capital, cap no, no, no. That is not going to stand with Jewish scholars, right? So please know how you bring forth your argument. So we could consider that, all right? Because now they also ask, they say, okay, there's the, 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 the no capital letters in Hebrew. And then they ask, well, where is the third Lord? If we have the first Lord and the second Lord, where's the third Lord? Where's the Holy Spirit? That's the objection, right? And then they say in, in, the, in Hebrew, it's two different words. One is yod heh vav -Heh, which they call Hashem, and the other one is Adon. So it's two different words. Why is it translated Lord, Lord? When in Hebrew, one word is yod heh vav -Heh, and one word is Adon. But in Hebrew, it's Adoni, which is my master. So these are the translations that are put forth. And they say also, it is not David speaking, it's the Levites who are speaking uh, words of praise for their master, King David. So this is regarding David. This is not a psalm written by David. And so they have all these arguments that they, they put forth. But I submit to you, our master is the supreme of the supreme court. All right. He, he, he's able to answer any objection, just as we see in this. Right. So let's consider one. Capitalization is given to show honor and is done in context. So you've got to remember that, all right? It is not inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's all written there. And you and all have to ask the Holy Spirit to give honor. That's why we would capitalize, right? So even though there's no uh, capitalization, we could capitalize it because it is showing something. Because how come in the Hebrew Bible, uh, when they write uh, L-O-R-D, it's caps? Why are they capitalizing that? 
because they want to distinguish this Lord from other Lords, right? It, 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 it's interesting what, what, what is being done, all right? And of course, they said, um, um, go, go with me to Mark chapter 12, verse 36. They, they were making the, the, the point that this was um, speaking about the Levites, you know? They were speaking about, the Levites were speaking about David, this is not the spirit of the Lord seeking anything else. But this is where now we have to believe our master, right? So in, in Mark chapter 12, verse 36, they said this wasn't, this wasn't a, a, um, any Holy Spirit thing. But, but the master said, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? Verse 36, David himself said in the Holy Spirit. David himself said in the Holy Spirit. So the Lord said to my Lord, the father, as it was speaking to the son, this is not the language we put it in. But the Father is speaking to the Son by the Spirit. So where is the third, my Lord? Right there. The fact that you're reading the Lord said to my Lord, Father, Son, and Spirit. Right there, of course, right? But again, we're just presenting arguments. Would they be accepted? Probably not. But at least we have a defense, all right? And of course, they said, okay, that is speaking about um, Lord. You know, this is the Levites uh, singing praises to their Lord, David. And I pondered that. I said, is that possible that they were speaking about their Lord David? Because they, in, in the book of, of, of Kings, you see they refer to uh, uh, my Lord, King David. So they call David Lord. But then Sarah also called Abraham Lord. The same word, right? And so which one is it? Again, context. Because you see, the same word means Lord. But we need to understand there is an overlord and there is an underlord. All right? Because Lord Adon, Adon Olam, master of the universe. That's our overlord. You have to know when we're speaking about our overlord and we're speaking about our underlord. So the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. And since he didn't tell the angels do that, this Lord, this my master, this my Lord at his right hand is an overlord. He's not an underlord like David. Are you understanding? David is not sitting at the right hand of, uh, of, of the son of, of, of father. So all these objections could be changed. And then right then in Psalm 110, go with me to Psalm 110 again. Go with me back to Psalm 110. You want to really plow into the Psalm 110. In verse 5, it says, the Lord is at your right hand. The Lord is at your right hand. Now, some Bibles have common L-O-R-D. But the Hebrew is Hashem is at your right hand. So right within the text, you're, they're showing that the, the Lord, the, the, my Lord in verse 1, is the same Hashem in verse 5. In other words, Yeshua is saying, I and my Father are one. I proceed from the Father. I am deity. This is what he's saying to us. And again and again, you and I need to be able to understand what is taking place here. All right. I want to uh, refer to you be before I go there. Go with me to Mark chapter 15, because you see, I believe Caiaphas, the high priest, got this. He got this. Let me let me just tell you what I mean by that. Go with Mark chapter 15 In Mark chapter 15. And I want you to look at verse 60. Mark chapter 15, verse six. Uh, Mark chapter 15. Did I say Mark chapter 15? I'm reading it here. Mark chapter 15, verse 6. Oh, I'm sorry. Not, not 15. Mark chapter 14. I'm sorry. Mark chapter 14, because that didn't line up. Rukashem. So Mark chapter 14. We want to pick it up from verse 60. He asks, he says, do you not answer what is it that these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him. Now, you're being questioned by the high priest, right? Mark chapter 14, verse 61. I said, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? Notice what they asked him. Are you the Christ? Are you the son of David? Are you the son of the blessed? No, don't you see what they asked him? Are you the Messiah who is Emmanuel? Are you the Messiah who is God? So in their text, they recognize that this Messiah who is coming, he's not just a man. He's more than man. They, they, they're revealing that they understand that. But look at what he said. Yeshua said, I am. In other words, I am human, son of David, descended from David, and I am also deity. Mm -hmm.